Welcome, everybody. Let's go ahead and uh, get this. Sorry for the hold up. We are working on our security. It's excellent this week. Welcome to Designing on the Front Lines, Episode 3. I'm your host, Morgan Hutchinson. Hey, and I'm Matt Fields. I'm an emergency physician and also a faculty in the Health Design Lab at Thomas Jefferson. And this is the third episode of Designing on the Front Lines, where we are bringing together designers and healthcare providers to make healthcare delivery better through better design. Welcome. Hope you guys are enjoying a nice Friday. It is rainy here in Philadelphia, and we are joining you with happy hour drinks, um, his and hers drinks. I've got a soft blanc. What do you have over there? Uh, I have a little bit of bourbon, one of my all-time favorites, Basil Hayden. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Tried and true. So we've got an amazing group of guests with us today. We're going to jump in. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late. We would like to encourage everybody to turn your video on, join us in our happy hour, and use the chat box to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do, what you're interested in, anything really, um, as long as you're not Zoom bombing us. Yeah, awesome. So we got some great guest guests here today. We have Sabrina Paceman from Fix the Mask. We have Aaron Peavy from HKS Architecture, and we have Nick Dawson from the Emergency Design Collective. So I am super excited to hear from all of them about the, what they've done and the cool design stuff they're doing. But first, I think we're going to do, do you mind if I do a quick share from this week, Morgan? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm helping Sabrina jump on. So you know what? I, I guess I'll allow that. Just this one. Awesome. Okay, cool. So this past week, I was working a clinical shift in the emergency department, and I got inundated with COVID patients, actually. Um, a nursing home, local nursing home, became a hot spot, and they started shipping all their patients over, and I was running around like crazy. And I needed to find one of our paper algorithms for working up the COVID patients and how to triage them appropriately. And I came across another example of poor design in healthcare, which was the lack of organization of any of our documents. It's again, another example of how I feel like healthcare is always a black hole of design. And I feel like it could really be better. I mean, like imagine if this was the cockpit of an airplane and this was how all of the emergency landing instructions were organized. Sorry, am I sharing my screen? I didn't share my I screen. I don't think so. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Sorry. I want to try that again. Uh, my screen didn't share. Now it is. Now it is. Okay. Although there's a lot of things. So All you right. may want to maximize that. Oh, whoops. All right. That went better in this in the rehearsal. Awesome. All right. So this is what I came across, and this was how things were organized at my desk. It looks like a picture probably the, in a hospital from 20 years ago, but this was last week, and this is what it looked like. And again, imagine if it was like the cockpit of an airplane, and these are how things were organized, and this was like emergency landing gear up here or something. I just, things really wouldn't fly, literally. And so, you know, um, a design challenge out there. How can we make this better, and why haven't we? Absolutely. That's a great uh, design challenge. I suppose since you've uh, mentioned one of the design challenges, I'll mention one of the design successes. Our students here at Thomas Jefferson University are super creative in our design lab, and they have been kicked off of the campus in order to keep uh, them safe, keep our PPE supply low, um, stable. And so they have been helping us in every way they can to design uh, ways to help us maintain our PPE supply. This is one of our students here um, who designed this 3D printed adapter to help us fix broken pappers. This is the bunny suit that we use when we're doing high risk intubations and other procedures. And so super proud of this guy. Yeah, that was awesome because these pappers were not functional simply because of a poor connector and you know, just to be able to custom 3D print an adapter to fix these was awesome. Well, I have one more share. Um, for those of the people who were on last week, I talked about this epic uh, dessert that's coming out. Uh, the Budina mixed with uh, coffee, and uh, I, I'm sad to say I still haven't been able to try it yet. It's uh, you have to special order and I haven't been able to paint it, but I will hopefully get it this week, and I will tell everybody about how awesome it is. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. I actually get daily updates from Matt on the Budina, so uh, thanks for today's update. Uh, our next thing, we're going to try out some cool things today on designing on the front lines. We're going to do the poll function, so everybody get ready to vote. We right, have so for all of you who are here on our prior episode for episode two, we had a Zoom bomber. And today we're gonna to share with you the reaction to the Zoom bomber and you're gonna vote for your number one reaction. Here they are. 
<laughs> so for those I of you who haven't ever seen <laughs> Zoom Bomb before, we were, and uh, it was it was pretty entertaining, I gotta say. So can we throw the poll up? Turns out the Zoom Bombing actually ranked pretty high, but what ranked higher was Ellen Lupton's headphones. I know, those are, those are amazingly cool. They are incredible. I've been looking for them all week. Um, I'm gonna need some, some tips on that one. All right, looks Ooh. like we get some votes coming in. Oh, one, one is a good one. That's a good. I know. One is pretty. Cool. One is pretty awesome. <laughs> Amazing. So, for those of Winning you guys, who, for those of you who haven't um, been there for our first two episodes, we did put them online. The recording on healthdesignlab.com/dotfl, so you can watch those. We did edit out the Zoom bomb. I'm sorry, but you know, if you really want to see it, let me know. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it was, that's why uh, you should join us live. Got to be live to see that stuff. All right, should we end the poll? Should Looks we like number go ones are into... one. There we go. Awesome reaction. Awesome. Uh, all right, all so right. let's jump into our speakers. What do you think? Let's jump into our, our speakers. speakers. Should we give a quick uh, talk about little... what's coming up next week? Yes, go for next it. Next week. All right, we'll just go ahead and plug next week while everybody's here. We already have two speakers lined up, and there's going to be another one. But the two speakers we have are. Two good friends of ours on the left is Mike Natter. He is a, a medicine resident and he's going into endocrinology, but he's also a cartoonist and he is on Instagram and he has like, I think a hundred thousand followers. He's at Mike, Mike Natter and he draws really awesome cartoons and gives commentary on medicine and healthcare and design and really just a really cool person to follow. So I'm really excited to hear from him. And Trish Henwood is a rock star in design and medicine. She's an emergency doctor along with us. She has a history in being a leader in designing a response towards the uh, Ebola pandemic in Africa. And she's been a leader also in the response to the COVID pandemic. She's gonna talk about how hospitals respond to COVID and how we change our practice. Cool. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into our first guest, Morgan. Uh, let's see. Sabrina is having trouble getting on. Oh. Maybe we could start with Nick. Okay. Nick, can you go? I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, I, right. I am impressed with all your uh, visuals and your multimedia here. I'm also impressed with anybody who can draw a cartoon of themselves, like, uh, what we just saw. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm I seeing... Oh, sorry. I just wanted. I just wanted to say real quick, Nick, I wanted to introduce you. Sorry to interrupt you. I was a... Nick is the co-organizer of the Emergency Design Collective. And he's got a background in starting and leading innovation programs inside health systems. And we have something in common. We, we actually met recently on a, uh, a, one of these kind of informal virtual chats um, where it was just a few of us. And we, we discovered we had something in common. We both recently left the same institution. Can I say that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, Kaiser Permanente. We both left there. And uh, so and we moved, moved on in our lives. So it was kind of an interesting thing in common. So Nick, sorry, go ahead. Just to pick up that theme, uh, I mean, I, I keep saying this in every one of these conversations that none of us would have wished these circumstances on the world, but I'm just so grateful that it brings us all together. And I'm seeing some familiar faces uh, in this meeting and, and familiar names, and I'm glad to get to meet some new folks. And man, I'm glad we met along the way. I'm also seeing people with incredibly well-kept hair, and I would like to understand your secret of how, how you people are all keeping trim uh, in, in this time. I'm afraid I'm never going to get to a barber again. Um, uh, so I, I don't have uh, a multimedia production, but what I thought I would do is just share a little bit about um, what the group I'm working with is working on and, and the way we're kind of seeing and approaching the world right now. And I uh, would love to hear also if this if it, if it sounds similar to work that everybody else is doing or thinking about. But um, I think from our point of view, uh, and this will probably be pretty familiar to anyone who's been working in health and health design for a long time, but the pandemic has um, kind of shown the entire world how fractured and siloed our health system is. And I'm saying system in kind of the big all-encompassing sense, but it's also showing us that we don't even really have a system in a lot of ways. Uh, we were really good at treating somebody's broken arm, for instance, but, but we see somebody's social isolation as if it belonged to somebody else and it's some other institution's problem to solve, if at all. Somebody's job loss as not part of their health, right, or somebody's access to food or transportation. Anyone who's worked in public health or worked uh, in social determinants of health, I'm sure this all rings true to you. But what I'm finding is that now as a society, we're all starting to have that same 
understanding and same realization that that almost every aspect of our life is fundamentally uh, connected to our health and our well-being. And when we got together to start the Emergency Design Collective, and I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that, but admittedly, we weren't even quite sure what it was going to be when we started. Uh, one thing we really were focused on, though, was how do we create urgent, rapid responses to some of those things, both in traditional healthcare settings, uh, but also some of those parts of life that are so connected to our health and well-being that don't always get the attention uh, that uh, internal innovation teams are able to give or apply to things that happen inside of a hospital or health system. Uh, and so we started this organization uh, first by just calling many of you, I see some familiar uh, faces who are working with us, uh, and people that had uh, started or led centers like uh, the one you all have at Jefferson or the ones that I've been a part of starting and, and leading. And it was a small handful of us. It was about 20 or 30 folks uh, who showed up. And we said, well, let's at least orient around what some of these big challenges are. What, what should we all be working on? And that kind of uh, grew to a group that as of this morning is over 500 people, um, kind of different levels of engagement and activity there. But, but a number of those 500 people are working across uh, more than 20 uh, really high fidelity, really amazing projects. And I'll touch on a few of them in a minute. But a lot of them are these things that are, that are those um, kind of social needs of health or, or non-clinical or upstream of sick care needs of health. And it's, it's just been um, really incredible to see that come together. It's, it's also made me think that it's a little bit of, um, uh, I hope I can use this and, and say it humbly, but there's a little bit of like a field of dreams thing there where I've talked to so many of our members who've all said, some version of, I have wanted to work in this space for so long, I've wanted to do something like this for so long, or I've been making products my whole life for big companies, I wanna do design work that has social impact, that improves people's lives, this feels like a space to do it. Um, so if, if nothing else, having been part of holding that space uh, in, in inviting people in and creating a big tent uh, has been just uh, absolutely incredible. Um, so it, it's led us to this place of asking the question of, we, we have this concept in the world of a B Corp, a benefit corporation. Uh, what does it look like for the new normal to have an H Corp? And, and maybe we're kind of prototyping the first H Corp, but I love the idea that that might be a new societal norm where any business or organization says, in addition to our core driver, we also feel responsible for the health and well-being of our employees and our customers or the communities we serve. What does it mean to be a a restaurant that values uh, the, the health of its workers every bit as much as the quality of the food it serves or the customers that come through the door? What does it mean to be a corporation that, that says the same thing, that our responsibility is to the health and well-being of our employees and the, the communities that we uh, inhabit or share? Um, so the, the types of stuff that the EDC has been working on um, kind of runs the gamut. It, it's kind of three big buckets of things. Um, one is designing for frontline healthcare and healthcare workers. Uh, some of that work, like probably a lot of you all, have been, has been focused around PPE uh, and creating a playbook of clinically vetted uh, PPE uh, face shields and gowns that makers can produce. And We've had some pretty dramatic results with that of being able to get uh, more than 2,500 face shields into, uh, into frontline clinical use and getting gowns into frontline clinical use. Uh, but some of it has also been around um, mental health and, and the, the in inevitable PTSD and the, 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 just the, the struggles of working in an extremely stressed system and environment. Uh, so there's some, some work unfolding there um, led by Tracy DeLuca that's absolutely incredible. There's another domain, which is uh, design for vulnerable populations. Uh, and, and that kind of runs the gamut of, of uh, anything that would be defined as a vulnerable population. Um, uh, Devika Patel and Mariko Kelly are doing work around the unhomed population. And it's, it's kind of taken two different slants, but one is about how do we connect, uh, kind of build a marketplace of, of being able to donate uh, abundance of resources, and then how do we have a marketplace of being able to get them to people that have needs? Uh, and then there's a, the work that's focused on how do we treat uh, homeless people with COVID and how do we do it humanely? And you may have seen some of the images that are coming out of these parking lots that are opening up. But it's great to give people a space, but that's not exactly a human experience. So how do we think about a more human experience there? Uh, there's groups working at different ends of the age spectrum. So Kate Piper is leading a, an incredible project around social isolation in seniors and also really quickly learned that people who are working in elder care spaces don't feel celebrated the way 
we're celebrating frontline healthcare. In fact, they feel stigmatized um, because of the high case rates in nursing homes. Uh, and there's another group working on teens and these amazing life milestones that they're having to experience in different ways and the struggles that teens have with isolation while trying to be socially distant. Um, uh, and uh, the other last domain is uh, what we're calling design for the new normal. Uh, it, so like many of you all, we're, we're all kind of thinking about if this is the great pause, the great time when society has all pushed pause in a, in a heartbreaking way, how do we come out of it designing a new normal that we want? Not one that's just functional and, and responding to the urgent needs, but how do we build something that is, um, that's the, the systems that, we, that, are, that are oriented around health and, and well-being, that are oriented toward seeing people as holistic humans, not just a need to be fixed or a nurse to round on patients. Um, some of that is heartbreaking. One, one team uh, led by Natasha Blom is working on uh, death and dying and grieving and, and end of life care wishes uh, in the age of the pandemic when some hospitals aren't even allowing visitors in. Another group is uh, working on um, kind of another end of that spectrum, which is how do you stay fit? How do you stay healthy? What about kids uh, who might be going to college on an athletic scholarship? What happens if there's no more sports to play for a year or two? What if that's your primary identity? Uh, so how do we start to design for a new normal? How do we design a new way of virtual distance learning that's not just taking the antiquated classroom model and sticking it on Zoom? Uh, so there's a lot of projects happening in that space. Um, and with that, why don't I take a deep breath and pause and Matt, you can react to some of this or focus me or maybe there's other folks that have similar experiences or working on similar things. You got me. Yeah, Nick. Oh, wow. That, that, that is great. I love design for new normal. That's totally right on. Um, I love hearing about the project. I have so many questions about what you guys are doing. I got to say, when all this was going on, I remember having a conversation at one point. I was like, wow, I really love a place that I could go to where I could just see somebody bringing together a lot of these projects. And I thought, should I do that? And I'm just so relieved that somebody else did that. And that you didn't, because <laughs> I had somebody better yeah. than me. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, and I have so many questions. I guess um, uh, I, I, I guess my first question I'd love to know is a little bit of how the sausage is made with some of these efforts, right? So how did, how did how, what, 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 tell us how it came about. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll tell you by way of a parallel anecdote. Um, my, my other half, my fiance, uh, comes from... Um, the Obama administration, her and several of her former colleagues got together and stood up the organization they're calling the U.S. Digital Response. So imagine kind of the government techie mirror to this health designy thing we're doing. And we were both getting started at the same time. And Amanda and I uh, kind of said, well, damn the torpedoes. We're going to run at this 100 miles an hour. We don't know what it's going to be. We'll make it up as we go. Uh, and the USDR spent a week really getting cl uh, clear about their processes and their um, kind of methods and in their kind of organizational structure. And in hindsight, I'm uh, lamenting that we may maybe could have done the same thing and had a little bit more intentionality. Um, but, but we really are doing it organically and in the fly, uh, on the fly. Um, so we had somebody step forward, uh, this incredible med student named Jess Hawkins, who said, I can help run operations. We said, huh, we didn't think about operations. We do need that. And Jess then said, I'm going to pull a team together. And so now there's four or five or six people that are made this, this, uh, ad hoc operations team and we're starting to have conversations around what does onboarding look like and so some of our IDEO alums said well we had this amazing onboarding process at IDEO let's let's borrow from that and some other best practices and now we've got a, a leadership training and a process for people who maybe not uh, have as much proficiency in design to be able to kind of ladder up through working on projects going through some training going through some onboarding uh, so Matt, it's a long-winded answer to saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, despite calling ourselves designers, we didn't actually design the organization and our, and, our, and our processes, but we're doing it as we go. And it's connected to what, what I think is probably the core tenet. The core value has been work in the open, do everything open. Uh, so we're calling it an open source design collaborative, but it's also the idea of like, if we're building it, we're going to build it together. You're going to see how the sausage is made. If you're into this kind of thing, you better be able to embrace ambiguity or making order from chaos because we don't have the answers. We've never done it before. So uh, a lot of that, um, how we're doing it is kind of being built on the fly. Yeah. And I mean, super impactful. I just saw the article that came out in New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, um, where you were looking at approaching the question of, you know, why are people afraid to go back to the emergency department? How might we, you know, make people feel better about going back to healthcare to take care of their needs? That's a huge issue we're seeing 
you know, patients are not coming to the emergency departments yet. We know they're still having heart attacks. We know they're still having strokes that, you know, those numbers don't change just because the pandemic's here. So that really cool. I mean, I'd love if, if, if you want to, I'd love if you comment on that project or if there's another project out there that just like kind of jumps to the top of your mind as like one of these uh, kind of uh, poster child products of the, of the EDC uh, effort. Um, you know, when I, uh, when people say, oh, I can't tell you which one of my kids is my favorite. I love them all yeah. equally. Yeah. I have that same appreciation for these projects. Um, it, it, it's also a really tremendous celebration of the people who are doing the work. It's, it's something that's very uh, different for me in this moment in time. When I've been inside health systems, I've, I've kind of split the role between the, um, the executive part of the job and, and also keeping up my craft and practice. And in this moment in time, I'm really stepping back and saying, what space do I need to create? what support do I need to give so that these project leaders can take over and, and run these things. So I, I touched on a few of them. I touched on a few of those names. Um, Laura is the, is the uh, doctor who led the uh, emergency room uh, design project, which is absolutely incredible. Um, there's a couple that are, because they started earlier, they're just a little more mature in their, their process because they've, they've had longer, a little bit longer runway. Uh, one is, is around blood donation uh, that's being led by Abby Don and, uh, Katie McCurdy, who I think many of us know is on that project. I think some other, uh, other folks are on that project uh, as well. And they, they started looking at, like, how do we make blood donations safer? And then very quickly realized, well, they've already solved for that. It turns out it was already pretty safe to do. But, but the real problem is in the messaging. How do we get the demand out there? How do we grow demand? And, and you all may know that blood supplies are in a really, really critical shortage right now. Uh, so their work has really been around creating demand and partnering with, uh, with other organizations who run blood donations to help them with messaging, to help them with protocol, uh, some of those things to make it um, kind of increase the, the messaging around how safe it is, how accessible it is. Uh, and they've just built this amazing prototype that's like this really simple web tool of like, am I eligible? And if so, get that part, like make the call to action, like really simple one click now all of a sudden you're registered, now you have an appointment, now you're donating blood. Um, so that's one that comes to mind. I said I wasn't going to pick one, so don't tell anyone I singled one out. They're all incredible projects. Awesome. Yeah. And um, I don't know how many time. I, I, there's one quick question here from, I want to get uh, some audience questions in as well. So I'll, I'll give this one question and then we'll go on. I love the idea. This is from Hamid uh, Ghanadan. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, I love the idea of an H Corp also wondering if B Corp already covers the health and well-being of its community. Also, one aspect of human well-being, for example, is the environment. And uh, what do you what do you think about about that question? Yeah, it, it's great. I think for us, H Corp has been just almost this notional concept. I don't know that we're uh, we're not going to come up with like the the better lab or the B lab and try to re really create a new um, corporate structure. Uh, but I think it 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 probably is implied in B Corp. So if the ones that I know that come to mind for me, Patagonia, for instance, uh, they do take the environment and the health and well being of their employees every bit as um, much of a priority as uh, as profits and revenue. So I, I like the idea that maybe that's already baked in. It, and maybe that is the thing that comes out of this is that more organizations formally adopt uh, a B Corp status. But, but if nothing else, I would just love it if our entire societal orientation toward health and well-being shifted to understanding that everything, that every part of our life is fundamentally part of our health. There's that graphic that I bet many of you know that's kind of the iceberg that says like look 20% of of your health and well-being is is medical care and is is medicine and genetics 80% is where we live what we eat what access uh, resources we have access to uh, what support systems do we have what it, what uh, what's our so uh, social life like how connected are we like just coming out of this with a societal understanding of that and starting to think about how do we treat people as the whole iceberg not just the little tip above the water uh, what systems do we have to have to do that that's to me what the the principle of an h corp is Awesome. So true. Well, thank you, Nick. I think we're going to go ahead and transition to our next speaker. Morgan, do you want to? Yeah, thank you, on? Nick, so much. It's really great to hear from you. We've all um, been a fan remotely here. So also calling in from San Francisco, we have our group from Fix the Mask. Sabrina P um, uh, Paceman has unfortunately learned today that I uh, have some severe technical difficulties as I we had a trouble getting her onto the call. But thank you, Sabrina, for Hanging in there, she is here now. She is a Cornell-trained mechanical engineer and a co-founder of the company Fix the Mask. 
that previously was a product designer at Google. And when the pandemic hit, came up with a very cool, very low budget solution that can be used anywhere in the world to um, basically fix the mask, creating N95 level masks out of surgical masks. Um, one thing that we always talk about with our students is how can you solve a problem using no money at all and how can you solve a problem using um, all the money in the world. And this is a really cool, very um, affordable solution for people across the world. So Sabrina, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Um, really inspired by the group here. Um, so let me share my screen. Can you guys all see? Yes, not perfect. All right, great. So um, as uh, Morgan kindly introduced, my name is Sabrina. Um, product design engineer actually trained at Apple um, and really excited to, to share this solution with you guys. So um, what is Fix the Mask? Uh, we are an organization that is working to supply safe masks to those in need quickly. And what that means is that, you know, this virus does not discriminate between income level, does not discriminate between occupation. Um, in order to actually stop the pandemic on a global scale, we need to be able to protect uh, everyone as much as we can. And in order to do that, the solution needs to be cheap and it needs to be effective. So um, how do we actually solve this? So as we all know, the standard for protection here is the N95 mask. Um, as you're well aware, there's a huge supply and demand problem. And th these are statistics that were done in the study in 2015 of like a hypothetical pandemic. So these numbers are sort of approximations, but it remains that there clearly is a huge supply and demand problem. So when attacking this, I try to understand what makes an N95 mask good and what else out there exists that potentially could get us to a similar level. And so when I took a look, um, what's interesting is that N95 masks and surgical masks actually have really similar stack ups. Um, N95 masks have an additional layer for shaping, but inherently they have the same filtration layers. And so when actually looking into something that would be similarly effective to an N95, um, I knew I wanted to go with something that actually had melt blend fabric that was charged inside of it. Um, we can go into more details about that later. But um, another thing that's really interesting is that uh, this is also is an outdated statistic, this is from March, but every day in China, they were making uh, 600,000 masks uh, N95 masks per day, but 200 million surgical masks per day. And after looking at the manufacturing processes for these masks, it's actually really striking how fast surgical masks are to produce. They literally, same input layers as you sort of saw from the beginning, they just cut them into squares and heat press them. Whereas N95 masks obviously have a lot more processing that is involved. Um, now from a cost standpoint, it's also really interesting. Uh, N95 masks uh, base cost, I think, costs on the order of like $2 materials costs, but as you're well aware, they're now on the order of $7 US, where surgical masks have remained cheap. And the really interesting thing here is that um, not all countries can afford to drop billions of dollars to buy N95s to protect their communities. Um, we need to be able to use what they have. Um, and if they have good quality surgical masks, uh, they need to be used more effectively. Now, what is the problem? with surgical masks. Well, an N95 mask is good because of two things. It filters well, um, meaning it can actually block through the bulk of the material. And also it fits well, meaning that it can't leak through the sides. And so um, our goal here at Fix the Mask was to basically, we know that filtration materials, um, these are the next best thing, right? And from a fit standpoint, uh, we figured that we could solve that with a relatively cheap device. So, um, where are we in testing? So we wanted to make sure that the solution wasn't just, uh, you know, like a gimmick of like, oh, like fit in general should be better. And so we actually wanted to test it, right? So um, from a, we actually focused on fit testing. We're, we're doing filtration later, we're tabling that for now, but we really wanted to just prove out the concept. Like if this concept works, um, then we would actually move forward to validating the full solution. And so from a fit standpoint, there are two methods to test fit. There is the qualitative saccharin test, which is shown on the left in the fit image, which is basically putting a bag over your head, spraying stuff inside. Um, we actually went with the one on the right, which is a quantitative method. And that quantitative method outputs a fit factor um, that I'll go more in depth into now. So um, that's what we ended up do, uh, collecting our initial data set with. And so I'll take you now through what data we have. So we had these two options. Um, let's to go into our data for version one. So as you can see, version one literally was rubber bands. And what's interesting about this is that we came up with version two first in our engineering brainstorm, but I had no rubber sheet in my house during shelter in place. And so um, I was looking for something to prototype this with, and I actually just found rubber bands. Um, 
But what was so interesting is that it was so effective that even though it looks so janky, I, we knew that it had to be something that we just shared because uh, it's so easy to put together. So how does this actually work? This is data from the University of Iowa Carver School of Medicine. Um, they actually just got published today in MedEx archive. So you can take a look through that um, later on. This is a lot of content, but let me take you through it. So um, what they did was they took rubber bands of the same size on 12 different faces. And uh, they attached these rubber bands through two different methods. They attached it with a paper clip behind their head, and then they attached it with paper, uh, rather, to uh, sides of a face shield, as you see in the bottom image. Um, the data is really cool. Uh, oops. So uh, here we have the paper clip overall fit factor. So we're going into the second column now. Um, what we have is that 11 subjects passed with the paper clip method, and the subject that did not pass actually. It's interesting because her face is so small that she's actually never been able to pass with an N95 mask before. So she's used to not passing this test. But when actually attaching the center seal up and back towards the sides of the face, uh, even she was able to pass with a passing fit factor. And so this was extremely promising. Um, going into this, the third column here, breakdown by subject. So the way that this fit factor test works is it's actually an average of seven different tests. One of those tests includes talking. So as you can see, all of the talking data for this is still not great, um, but that's actually common. Even N95 masks have an issue passing the talking test. Um, so what determines whether or not something is passing is whether or not you have like an average fit factor that is passing, and that is what we achieved uh, with just rubber bands. So this was really encouraging, and it's something that we immediately shared because the data was so good from the beginning. Um, but the problem here is that this solution is not the most comfortable. So uh, my team wore this solution for six hours. Um, after around hour four, I noticed it started getting uncomfortable on my nose cartilage area. Um, and after hour six, when I removed the mask, I definitely had a big indent. And so it's not something that like, can necessarily be worn comfortably day in and day out. So we knew that we had to iterate on this design. So, oh, I did have this. Cool. Sorry, my internet's a little bit slow, I guess. Um, so we came up with version two. Now, version two, as I mentioned, is something that we had from the beginning. Um, the band was wide. Uh, so we were hoping that the width of the band would help improve the comfort. Um, now let's look at our data for version two. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of iteration work done. <laughs> I can go into detail here, but we can talk about it later too. Um, so moving forward. Well, moving forward, we have data for version two. Um, is, is my screen advancing for you guys? Oh, here you go. Uh, okay, version two. So version two, we have a much smaller sample size of data. Um, it was done internally. And you can see that version two, whoa there. Version two worked well for um, only one of the four participants. So, uh, but version two with cushions added actually got all participants uh, above the N95 factor level. Um, we tried the same test with also a KN95 and found the same thing. So uh, we now have fabrications of version 3.1. And now this is actually incorporated um, not only the cushions, but also a bunch of other factors for improved comfort. Um, we have prototypes of these. And what we're looking for right now is actually to get a larger sample size of our version 3.1 design. So taking you guys through it, um, I hope my computer isn't crap on me again, but um, basically we added nose cushions, secondary head straps so it doesn't slip off the top of the head, and added neckties. And actually what's interesting is that um, having a dual joint as opposed to a single joint like our original design is actually a lot um, more comfortable. So uh, with these prototypes, our next steps are basically all we need is more data. We just need people to help us collect lots of different data on lots of different faces. Um, so what my call to action to this group is, is if you guys have access to any of these three things, uh, please reach out to me. So if you have access to filtration, a TSI 8310A system or equivalent, uh, would love to get more data on filtration. Um, from a FIT standpoint, we have the, uh, if you have access to a Port Account Pro, like I will send you braces. And if you would like, if you or your hospital would like to pilot a study at your hospital, um, please reach out to me. Um, if you don't have access to a Port Account Pro and just want to give us comfort feedback, we are actually crafting a 15 to 30 day study where we ask participants to wear this device 
um, multiple days uh, in a row and basically let us know if it was uncomfortable, what was uncomfortable, if you didn't wear it today, why didn't you wear it today, et cetera. And we're, we're actively looking for that feedback too. Um, so that is where we are in our status. Uh, any questions following up? Thank you so much, Sabrina, for coming on the show. I've been trying to get you guys on the show since before we even started, and I'm so excited that we got you here today. Um, this is like an incredible solution, so elegant, so um, you know, easy to implement, and so cost effective, especially since there's such a lack of N95s. And let me tell you, you guys wore that for six hours, and you had marks on your face, and you felt like it was uncomfortable. Like we were at N95s for all of our shifts every single day, and they are incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, is there anything that I, I just wonder, like from a design perspective, is there anything in your history as an engineer that you thought like that sort of inspired this? I know that you said you were sort of trying to find some way to prototype and that just kind of ended up being so successful. But yeah, can you compare it to anything else you've ever done. Um, I think what makes design in general powerful is understanding the core of the problem and then iterating on the fragments of the breakdown. So let me, so basically taking N95 masks at the time, at the end of March, a lot of people were making things that looked like N95 masks. They would make the 3D printed body and they would basically just swap out the filter material. But actually the thing that was interesting here was that it wasn't the shape of it that made it effective. It's actually the filtration material and understanding, basically breaking down the innovation into core blocks and basically saying, okay, the, the filter material is good and it exists. Like, how can we actually improve the thing that actually matters, which is fit? So I think that what makes a good design and what I sort of pulled upon in my design history to basically make better designs moving forward is to really understand the problem fully before trying to iterate on a design. Um, yep. Amazing, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So it's, I know that you guys are trying to reach certain people and there's a lot of people on this call who are trying to, you know, reach out and contact each other. So what we want to do next is actually bring everybody into breakout rooms. So people can talk in smaller groups, um, sort of introduce themselves in a more friendly sort of small way. We're going to do a yep. five minute breakout room and. Yeah, I want to actually, I actually want to like, before we, I mean, it's just so cool how many people we have and from all over. I see Grace from Sarasota, Florida. What's up, Grace? I see Kristen Apple. Hey, you were on last week from Boulder. Hey, hey, Kristen. Uh, we also saw such a Toronto. Oh, Colleen from University of Michigan. Hey, Colleen. Oh, and I can't forget the mission. Alan Lupton uh, from the she's a curator Cooper Hewitt and Smithsonian Design Museum in New York, and she was one of our guests last week. So, thanks for coming back. And I think I also saw some guests from outside the country. I saw Toronto and last week we had Mexico. We've had um, and, uh, some participants from Africa and Ireland. It's been great. Hey man. Yeah. Hey, what's up? And then we also, I thought I also saw, um, Oh, Maverick. Two from Toronto. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. And I also saw Dublin, Michelle flood. Thank you guys for, for joining from all over. This is really, really awesome to be able to get together despite the issues with everybody being able to get together and, the pandemic so this is really cool all right so yeah should we go into breakout rooms and get to know each other absolutely let's do it Love all right everybody you, uh... should introduce themselves share what drink they're having on on a friday afternoon and uh Even if it's tell water. us what you're doing so great uh, wow that went by way too quick i just got I we just got cut off in the middle of a, a question so oh boy but we've only got 10 minutes yeah sorry so we do not want to delay any further we have a super amazing last speaker today um erin peasy she is an architect who has focused on health and wellness throughout her career she has won multiple different awards for her awesomeness she works with HKS and she's been named uh, best under 40 by the Academy of Architecture for Health and um, has just been so great to come on the show today. So Erin, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and I come from a family of physicians and um, uh, care professionals of different sorts. So I'm, I feel humbled to be here with you guys. 
Uh, yeah, I'm an architect and design researcher. I uh, have a background in psychology as well. Um, and I think really, um, I've been, I spent a lot of time in healthcare, which is how I know Bonn originally, um, but I've spent the last few years really focused on social isolation and loneliness and the role of the built environment. And I originally was not gonna do slides, but I think I am now, cause I was just, we have a little slide deck from a presentation we did a few days ago. I just wanna talk real quick about sort of loneliness and social isolation and how they're actually a little bit different. Uh, I think all of us are now fairly familiar with some social isolation. Um, and that's, you know, objectively being alone. But loneliness is this subjective feeling of being alone, um, which we can feel whether we're in a crowded room or all by ourselves. Um, and let's see if I can get the slide. There we go. Um, and we understand that these have some serious health impacts, um, increasing our um, risk for early death, um, for social isolation and for loneliness, um, and even just for living alone. So I've been thinking a lot about that um, as, a, as a way of how do we reach out to people right now and how do we design our environments differently um, to support people that are either living alone or, um, or co-living. Um, and know, we know that being socially connected reduces the risk of death by 50%. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and there's no doubt that it's a national health epidemic. I mean, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about um, the economic recession and all of the concerns around that, but there's also a social recession. And um, I think that the health impacts long-term of you know, something that's very necessary of protecting ourselves right now uh, are gonna ripple for a very long time. And I think really what, um, I love the idea, I've been taking a bunch of notes, um, but um, when Nick talked about design for the new normal, I actually am starting a podcast series that is about envisioning what that could be, what our environments could be, and what we're learning from this period that we wanna be able to see for the future. Um, so when this had all started, I just, it was basically like the, this got, um, South by Southwest was canceled, and we were gonna be presenting around uh, this framework to talk about what is important when we design for social health, and social connection. So we talked about how important it is to have these spaces be accessible, to have them activated and um, full of different types of things that meet different types of people's needs. So uh, also to have, have choice in, do you wanna be sort of by yourself and alone and sort of watch the people, or do you wanna you know, collect in a big group space? We're all sort of along that continuum at different times. Um, and, and I think all of these uh, have kind of become blurry to us because uh, everything is changing so quickly and a lot of the things that we just saw, we can't do right now. Um, and so I think that still, as we think about both what our physical environment should look like and how we want our virtual environments to look as well, there's a lot to take away. There's a lot that we can still do um, understanding this framework. Um, and I think that's that's really kind of part of what I wanted to share is to talk about, um, you know, I, Nick, I was so excited to hear you talk about social determinants of health. Um, and I think, you know, the once we start to look into the literature, we understand that the way that our built environment is created um, impacts all sorts of things from our social connection to um, how physically fit we are, and you know how whether or not we get asthma. I mean, there's uh, and I think you know as we have become more and more autocentric, um, we've sort of taken away from the human realm. So we've become more dispersed, and we spend longer times driving, um, and we spend more time sort of pulling into our garage and going inside versus like hanging out outside and meeting our neighbors. So Morgan had mentioned, um, like I've talked a lot, I'm on a crusade to promote front porches because they're just, <laughs> they're just the best sort of, uh, we, we kind of talk about threshold spaces, that in-between space where you can connect with your neighbors, you can connect with other people, but still be sort of safe. Um, and I think that's how we used to design. We used to design for human needs um, and we always should. Um, and I think that, you know, as we plan for what is it that we want, I think that we need to hold our architects and our legislators and our, you know, code officials to 
a norm that doesn't just look at, you know, what is short term economically profitable or, you know, benefits uh, a small section, but sort of understand the ecosystem around the spaces that we're creating. Um, so Julianne Holt Lundstedter, who is a Holt Lundstedt, who is a um, researcher that has spent her whole career sort of focused on this area. We've been talking about um, some specific areas like Macau or like um, there's a, I can't remember the name right now, but it's a place in Italy that um, they're sort of isolated, but they all are very socially connected, but they're able to sort of keep themselves safe um, because they have, you know, that, that sort of border and they're completely interdependent um, and form sort of an ecosystem that is self-contained. And so um, I've kind of been using that as an analogy of, well, what if, what if we were able to create spaces that look like that, neighborhoods that look like that, um, where we had our groceries and we had our schools and, um, and the people that supported us that lived next to us. I think um, there's no doubt that we were, you know, we evolved and we're born as people that were meant to connect with one another. Um, and in no way is that only about the built environment, but I think a lot of times we, like the built environment is just in the background. We're like, no, 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 that stuff, that doesn't really, it doesn't really impact our behaviors. And it, it does in these little ways of uh, what we call affordances. It's sort of like, you know, how, how easy, Matt, I loved the um, uh, design challenge that you set up, you know, like how much better would it be if, it didn't look like that when you went into work. And so I think, um, yeah, so I know that we're close on time, so I wanted to keep it short, but thank you guys thank for Thank you so me. much, Erin. It's like incredible to have you here. I could listen to you talk for an hour about all of this. I feel like, I feel like all of us could, right? <laughs> You're so sweet, thanks. Um, so we like, I think that, you know, what you're kind of, to me, one of the things I've been thinking about is so many people are like, why are we calling it social distancing, right? Like, why don't we call it physical distancing and think about how we can stay socially close in a time where we have to be physically distant? Yeah. You know what I mean? I think, so I think that's so cool to yeah. hear you talk about, you know, how you imagine space in that kind of, in that way. Well, and the, and the, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I think one of the things that um, is clear is that like, we're, we're meant to, you know, know our neighbors um, and we're meant to connect with more, people on a, on a repeated sort of casual basis. Um, and so the, the report that I put out um, looks at the ways in which design impacts um, social capital uh, and so both strong and weak ties. So sometimes it's like, I feel like we're moving to this digital realm where people drop off our groceries and we don't need to like see as many people. But the thing is, is like that interaction um, with the barista or with the, um, with a grocery person. There's actually research that's showing that um, that can be really important for people's mental health and even people coming out of addiction and trying to stay out of addiction um, is that, that those casual interactions repeatedly, you know, it's sort of like that sustaining, especially the more we live alone. So yeah, thanks. Absolutely cool. Matt, I know that we were uh, flipping coins on who got to ask you what questions and Matt actually won <laughs> well, that. I, coin had, talk, so I'll, I mean, I I'll had so many it. questions for you that actually, I mean, I love in, I love what you were talking about. We, we did some editing, so don't worry. Aspects. It'll only be, you know, and, couple yeah, hours. And, yeah. I know. And I was um, you know, just listening to a podcast about like you know, Kirk Fried and like facilities and all this stuff. And like, but, um, uh, you know, and of course, I, I've been actually taking um, a uh, like deep dive into um, uh, a lot of looking at how we leverage our existing built environments to combat a lot of these patient-centered outcomes and actually provider-centered outcomes, and uh, especially in the emergency department. And I'm actually, and I was having this great conversation too with another another architect too, who was talking about um, uh, how things are different in the United States as to other other areas in terms of things we do in our healthcare systems, in our hospital, specifically with just small things like, you know, windows, big thing, yes. right? Like, yes. like, why don't we don't open our windows in the United States, but in yes. other countries they do and they ventilate. And is that, is that impact, you know, health? Does that yes. impact viral yes. transmission? Is that impact yes. COVID? And does like, that, you know, and does it impact your ability to, uh, for instance, combat COVID when a hurricane comes through and when you have no power and, you know, like, I mean, I lived through Sandy um, and in my 
uh, NYU and a number of others sort of shutting down and not having power. And it's like, well, gosh darn it, it would have been great if you could have opened your window. Um, and, yeah. you know, I, and, uh, and been able to, you know, both experience that for a lot of reasons. So, yeah, I love that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, I don't know, I want to keep this conversation going, but we are at, at time. And so I, I, you know, it's Friday, Friday afternoon. So please, <laughs> everybody we work on like, you know, time, uh, keeping it exactly that six o'clock time. <laughs> yeah. So please, everyone, um, you know, keep in touch with us and we will definitely, um, we want to hear what you guys want to hear about and conversations you want to have. And if we need to continue one of these conversations and, I think we need to continue all of them, but you know, we can do that. Um, we have a couple of great speakers lined up for next week and, um, uh, and, and we're planning to add a third one as well. Um, and yeah, so I think we're going to um, go ahead and call it. It's at six o'clock. I'm going to try and um, cue up a little outro music and everybody. Thank you guys uh, so much um, for joining us this week. Last week we've gotten so much support from all of you and please reach out to us. I'm going to send out the link to the poll and email it out to you guys later, but we have really enjoyed connecting with so many people in the last couple weeks and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody.